and um, welcome to this session, Dead Body Language, uh, Positioning, Posture and Representation of the Corpse. My name is Sean Mui, I'm based in the University of Durham and um, to begin introducing, introducing this session, at Pat Maya Madala's funeral, possession at the end of Star Wars Episode 3, she lies <coughs> supine with extended legs in an open casket. Her arms are folded, with hands resting on the stomach. We see Boromir Gondor and Joffrey Baratheon positioned in a similar manner, and they're lying extended and supine, arms folded, with hands on the stomach. Um, again, but in a very different context, we see this posture replicated at the funeral of Pope John Paul II in 2005. He lay in state in an extended and supine position, and like pa uh, Padme, Boromir and Joffrey, his arms were bent with hands resting on the stomach. While it might seem proper, normal and suitably respectful in the eye of the modern viewer, that the body of the deceased is laid out in an extended and supine position with hands on the stomach, this preference is hardly universal or timeless. The process of laying out the dead is underlain by spoken and unspoken rules about how the corpse should be presented. For though it seems obvious that the posture of the corpse has significant impacts on the representation and experience of death at the outset, Studies of corpse positioning is seriously lacking in any given time period or in a geographical region. The positioning of the cadaver has often been taken for granted among anthropologists and archaeologists. In particular, the extended supine position, widely employed in the modern Western world, um, is frequently assumed to be the universal standard position for the corpse and is often glossed over or even omitted in archaeological excavation reports ethnographic field notes and research literature. In the next 10 minutes or so, I wish to provoke some new thoughts on the topic of corpse positioning and challenge you to critically assess how burial positions have been so far um, been approached by archaeologists. In the seminal anthropology handbook, Notes and Queries, the section on burials states 39 questions relating to funerary practices to be asked by the field <coughs> anthropologist. Three of these questions directly addresses the positioning of the corpse. Um, these questions acknowledge that preferences for cadaver positions vary from one society to another and are important things that the field anthropologist should observe and make note. In the Christian tradition, the corpse is almost invariably laid out upwards um, with extended legs. This position has been the standard practice in Western Europe for over a millennium, alongside inhumation and West its orientation. Even though cremation has now become commonplace, especially in Britain, the extended supine position remains to this day the most frequently employed position for the corpse in the coffin. Nevertheless, what constitutes a normative corpse position may vary greatly between different cultures. Beaker burials of, na of late Neolithic and early Bronze Age Europe, for example, were commonly associated with flex or crouched bodies laying on one side, generally accompanied by grave goods. The variability in preferences and practices of corpse positions is also evident in ethnographic records. In Islamic funerals, for example, the corpse is washed and shrouded following specific sets of routines, um, which may vary between different regions and communities and buried extended and on its right side facing Mecca. In Tibetan sky burial rites, the body is arranged and wrapped to secure in a tightly crouched position with hands in front of the chest and head against the knees. The body is then carried to the mountains in a ritual procession before it is cut and prepared for excarnation. Sometimes more than one body may be placed in the same grave. The Lufus burial found in Italy captured a great deal of media attention when it, when it was excavated in 2007. And people write about the intimate embrace and imagine tragic love stories, and they're very generally quite moved by the image of the bodies. In other cases, children may be arranged with adults in a grave, such as grave 81 in the Anglo-Saxon cemetery at Lechley in Gloucestershire, which contained the bodies of two adult women and three children. And even Charles Dickens made an allusion to a mother-child double burial in the death of Clara Copperfield, the mother of David Copperfield. To this day, despite great improvement in medical research and pregnancy support, 
as well as reduction in maternal and infant mortality. The emotions and intimacy conveyed by the positioning of corpses may still be readily sympathised. In a more recent example, just March this year, a pregnant woman from southwest Scotland died 14 weeks before the baby was due, and her family tucked the baby into the crook of her arm just like they were both sleeping together. Sometimes, bodies are arranged in unconventional positions in funerals as markers of special statuses or individual preferences. In the funeral procession and cremation of Jaina ascetics, the corpse is arranged in a sitting position, upright, cross-legged and meditative, a position historically restricted to the funeral of royalty, and that um, dead Jaina ascetics are carried and cremated in a sitting position may be an allusion to their rebirth in the upper world as kings. The dead may also be displayed or buried in lifelike postures, such as the curious case of Jeremy Bentham, who had left instructions for his body to be dissected, preserved and displayed at the University of London after his death. A more recent example is New Orleans woman Miriam Burbank, who died in 2014, and whose dead body was propped up against a table with a provision of cigarettes, beer and whiskey, as if enjoying a party at her house. That these unconventional treatments of the dead attract so much media attention points at the fascination, anxiety and discomfort we feel towards the dead body, especially when arranged in socially unsanctioned positions. On the other hand, the lack of care in the positioning of the dead may suggest hasty or intentionally disrespectful disposal, as we heard, um, heard about um, a bit earlier on today. This is particularly evident in mass graves, where the dead, from plague <coughs> victims to fallen soldiers, are deposited in this orderly manner, and limited attention is paid to their positioning. At Sutton Hoo, Suffolk, a number of burials survived as dark stains on the soil and were arranged in unusual positions. Some seemed to have their hands or feet bound, and others were decapitated. This has led to the excavator to suggest that the site was used as an execution cemetery in the 8th and 9th centuries AD. For us, being used to seeing bodies laid out in an extended supine position, there is something unnerving about these deviant burials. And we notice these so-called deviant burials because they were not what we expect them to be, but our idea of the normative is very much historically and culturally situated. <coughs> While the extended supine position is not exclusively used by Christians, I contend that Christian preference for this position has strongly influenced the trajectories of burial cultures in Western Europe. The effects of Christianity on the adoption of the extended supine position are not only evident in early medieval Europe, but also in European contact with indigenous populations in the New World in the 16th and 17th centuries. But given the historical and cultural, signif uh, the historical and cultural situatedness of our funerary preferences and norms, it would be a serious methodological oversight to assume that the extended supine position is universally normative and to neglect to record it or study it seriously when it occurs. On the other side of the coin, it's equally important to acknowledge variability within Christian practices as local communities retain freedom to choose in what ways they bury the dead. The Christian way, or so-called Christian way, of burying the dead had never been static or uniform, but it was subject to religious changes, medical, medical developments and local negotiation for over a millennium. And that Padme, Boromir and Joffrey and Pope John Paul II are buried in the same manner is not a sheer coincidence, nor is it a reflection of a universal standard. Instead, it reminds us that what we define as the ideal burial position is historically and culturally rooted in centuries of Christian thoughts and practices. It is the role of archaeologists to put aside our ethnocentric assumptions and uncover the vibrancy and significance behind the representation of the corpse, both in the past and in the present. Right. So that's the end of my introduction. If you have any question about that, just grab me in the end. But I need to move on to my first speaker.